Hi, I'm Andrew Coxdarkey, and this is SEO in 2023. Andrew, what's your number one SEO tip for 2023? David, my number one tip for things to for people to consider in 2023 is intent. Intent. Okay, so intent is a big word. Um, well, it's like a big six letter word, <laughs> not particularly meaning the same thing to different people. So, so what does it mean to you? It was deliberately ambiguous. So when you were kind of, we were kicking around topic ideas and I was thinking about what I should talk about, I, I chose intent and I thought, well, you know, I could focus it down onto that and I could focus it down onto that. And then I thought, well, actually I'll leave it deliberately kind of broad and hopefully we can kind of kick around some of the ideas around all those kind of things that come up when I talk about intent. So intent is really important in SEO because it should really pay a key part in all that kind of planning and processing that people are doing around SEO work. You know, the obvious one is what is the intent when somebody is searching for something? So when somebody Googles that thing they put into Google, what is it they're looking for? What is the answer to the question that they want? And then the aim for us as SEOs is to then try and match our content and say, oh, well, we've got the answer and we know what you're looking for. Here it is. Here's the answer. But it, it does go a lot broader than that. Like there's lots of different types of intent. And I think it comes even before that when people are doing their kind of keyword research and looking into queries and things that they want to rank for. What is the business's intent? Like I often deal with this with clients and they're thinking, oh, well, you know, we need to produce more content. We need to write this thing and write. And it's it, why, why are you writing it? What is your intent for this piece of content? Often it's a very simple, simple thing of we want to sell more stuff. But it's like, well, which stuff? And to who? And how often? And all those kind of things. So to really kind of reel that back and keep, you know, banging that intent thing all the time, bang the intent drum of like, you know, what do you intend to do? And what do your customers intend when they're searching for that thing that you're trying to match this into? Uh, I think that intent thing is, yeah, deliberately broad, but something that's really important across all kind of stages of SEO. So when in... Establishing intent, intent, what comes first? Is it the customer, the business, the product, or something else? I think it has to be uh, the customer because, you know, you can have an intent as a business of like, you know, we want to rank for Facebook. Great. Are you Facebook? No. But then you're not going to rank for that or you shouldn't. So I think thinking about that kind of thing, and, you know, businesses generally have answers to these questions already when you ask them these kind of tricky questions like you'll say like oh well you know who are your customers and what do they what do they mean when they're looking for these kind of things and they go oh we don't know and they do really like you know lots of businesses already have this stuff planned out they'll have their customer types they'll have their user journeys and all these things there's some great ways that you can then show them how seo feeds into these things because they'll have these lovely funnels everybody loves a funnel in marketing right um, so we have all these funnels that we're aware of, like, you know, this kind of awareness stage and then consideration and then conversion and then retention. And it's well, a lovely funnel and all that kind of stuff. But actually, you know, much as I love funnels, I also hate them because no customers do that. Nobody ever tra travels through. If you actually map a user journey from when they first started thinking about potentially that thing that you sell and then they buy it, they never or very, very rarely flow perfectly through from you know, they're unaware of your brand, then they're aware, then they consider you, then they convert, and then they're happily retained forever and ever, and they just pour all their money into your bank account. It never really works like that. Like, people mess your funnels up all the time. They'll constantly zigzag around. You know, they'll be jumping up and down through your funnel. They'll think about things, and then they'll get halfway down, and then they'll change their mind, and they'll come back and consider another product, and then they'll come off it. But then they'll consider another product, and then they'll consider their budget and the color and their availability and all this. And so they'll jump around in your funnel all the time, and it's never this beautiful linear journey. So thinking about that kind of thing from a customer point of view, and then showing how that maps with SEO, like then you put the pieces of content that a website has onto this funnel and you say okay well you've got 50 pieces of content all top of funnel and you've got 10 pieces of content all bottom of funnel and you've got nothing in the middle and that suddenly shows a really big like you know all right well there's all these people that are looking for stuff in the middle to help push them that last stage and you haven't got anything you've got all this kind of like you've never heard of us and you know we're optimizing and you should consider us for all these kind of things and awareness and then get them but there's nothing then pushing them through those next stages of the funnel and mapping that kind of stuff to those, those, you know, the intent of customers, to the content that they've got, to those funnels and user journeys that lots, lots of companies already have, can often be really eye-opening. So there are so many different ways that I can start to unpack that. But I think that you've got a lot of experience with um, talking to businesses for the first time, onboarding clients, getting a great feel of what the business does. So 
What are some questions that you tend to ask top executives in a business, MDs, um, other top players in the business, in terms of the intent behind the business, the intent behind the product? How, how do you establish that for the first time? Yeah, it, that can be an, an interesting one to unpick because lots of companies, when you start with them, it's, you know, you'll say like, well, who's your target audience? And the stock response is everyone. Everyone wants our stuff. And then if you pick into that a little bit more, they don't. It's like, you know, it's, it will be some, you know, new modern piece of kit or like the latest flip phone and things. And it's like, oh, well, every, everybody should have a flip phone and this amazing piece. And it's like, well, does my mum need one? Like, you know, she's in her 70s and she struggles with her basic Nokia. She doesn't, she doesn't need it. She doesn't want it. She's not your target. Girl. Yeah, so that, that kind of thing. So those kind of questions of really picking into who their target audience are and then also making them think about what kind of things they want. Like, what do they need more of? Because that's often a question that I start with with customers because, you know, they'll have all these really broad things that their business does. Like, you know, there's very few businesses that just sell one product. If it's a service industry, they'll have kind of, you know, different scales of products that they'll do. You know, if they sell cars, they might also do servicing for the cars. They might also spell, uh, sell spare parts for the cars. They'll have training courses and things that they do as well. And so then it can often be a case of getting them to focus on the right kind of things. And you'll say to them, okay, well, if I could get you 100 more customers tomorrow, who do you want? Do you want more people buying your cars? Do you want more people booking their services? Do you want more people like, you know, going on trip? And it, that can often make them think about, well, actually, yeah, well, buying the cars is nice because that's where we make the most money. But actually what we need is and what helps sustain, sustain us through the long winters is people getting their cars serviced. So we need, a, if, you know, what we really need for the business at the moment is a hundred more of those because they're, you know, more retained business. We don't, you know, people buy a car and they never come back again for 10 years. Whereas a, a person who has a really good service will come back once a year, every year. So it's often asking them those kinds of questions, like who are your most profitable customers? Which ones do you want more of? And that those kind of, and, uh, you know, again, the, the standard response is more of everything, please. It's a bit like, okay, if you had to choose, my kids always do this kind of thing, like, you know, if you had to choose, you know, have spaghetti for fingers or spaghetti for hair. It's, they're both awful decisions sometimes, but like, you know, trying to push cust uh, clients to do that kind of thing of like, you know, if you had to choose one type of customer that you want more of, which would it be and why? That can be really interesting. So let's turn to user journeys now and the, the different intent behind different stages of the user journey. Conventional user journeys incorporates seeking information, consideration, purchase oriented decision. How do you go about mapping intent to those different stages and targeting the correct person, uh, target consumer at the, at the right moment, at the right time? So yeah, there's the types of intent you talk about. So again, most people uh, will understand a lot of these things or know that they'll have either done them themselves or they'll be marketers and they'll have come across these terms before. So, you know, these kind of informational queries. So they want to know, you know, who did this thing? You know, I'm looking for ideas for this kind of thing or what's a definition of this kind of thing. They're, you know, in the early stages of exploring a topic and there's those kind of navigational things. They already know what they want. They want Majestic. So they're just going to Google Majestic or they might even Google Majestic.com or those kind of things. Those are kind of, you know, they already know what they want or they're looking for a particular place. Sometimes they'll want to go to that coffee shop they went to last week and they'll search for the name. And then those transactional commercial ones that you kind of mentioned already. And Google talks about those too. If you look at Google's documentation and all their kind of guidelines around these kind of things, they have these terms which they call do, go and know. So if somebody wants to do something like go somewhere or go to a website, they want to go somewhere, go to a particular website, go to a particular place. Or they want to like um, know something. So like, you know, who was the first person to do this? What's the world record for the high jump when they're watching the athletics on TV? All these kind of things. So it does match up to what Google is saying. So they're trying to do this too and trying to steer people towards these ideas as well with their content. And so then matching those kind of things up, then you have to look at what the types of query are. So those kind of words, those qualifying words, like the transactional ones is, is always a good one because, like, you know, people, when, once they've got through that kind of stage of they're looking at all the options available, like a Mercedes, a Porsche, a Lexus, whatever it is they're considering, even if it's down to then like, you know, different types of socks or whatever products that they're considering, your competitors. And once they've got to that point, if they've decided that, well, I'm kind of between these two now, I've narrowed it down, I've got my short list, we've all done this, you know, when you're buying things. And then you go and search for a voucher because you're like, oh, I want 10%. They already know if they're searching for, you know, Amazon voucher, they're searching for well, Amazon voucher, probably a bad because they want to buy one, but, you know, discount code, they'll be searching for, you know, brand name discount code. They're telling you and they're telling Google, I already decided what I want to buy and from who I'm just looking for some money off. So those are the kind of things where it's like, right, 
if they're looking in the adding those qualifiers in like voucher coupon buy price deal all those qualifiers added to keywords and queries that shows you the kind of intent behind that if they're asking those kind of who what where why how questions that's probably slightly higher up the funnel back to more to that kind of informational type they're just kind of kicking around ideas and something that i think i kind of wanted to mention here as well is that it comes to this this kind of conflict you sometimes get between what the business wants and their intent and then what Google wants and Google's intent, because that's they're always a, a key person to consider in this person thing. Have a look entity. at the Google search results. Entity. An entity, yeah, we touch on entities too. But so when you look at Google and you look at their search results, they'll often have indications of what people want. You know, So a good example, I, I was reading um, a piece from uh, Thomas Nagoda from Surfer. When people search for hairstyle ideas, they don't want 6,000 words about you know, the, your favorite. They want pictures. And when people search for like, how do I fix my dishwasher or how do I fix this issue on my car? Generally, they want videos. They want somebody to talk them through it and explain it. And Google will show that. Google will have like, you know, video boxes. They'll have image boxes. They'll start to bring in the most prominent bits of search. You know, if it's a quick answer, like how old's Barack Obama is the classic one. It'll be there in a knowledge box. It'll just be there on the, on the search results. So that kind of stuff can then show you what Google thinks that people are looking for. You know, you can try and hijack the search results and force what you think is the right answer in there. But sometimes that can be a longer, longer process of persuading Google that this is the better answer. So, yeah, trying to find and that kind of match between what the, the business wants, what customers are looking for and what Google is showing people. That's the sweet spot. OK, so Google is obviously getting more clever in terms of being able to deliver content that better matches a user intent. So... You as a business, you as an SEO, you certainly want to try to ensure that you're serving the intent as closely as possible, matching the intent as closely as possible. So how do you go about determining that the content that you produce is most likely to be a close match to someone's intent? Is it simply a matter of looking at the SERP for the phrase that you're attempting to target or other other ways to do this? So I think an important thing for me on these kind of things and the way I work with clients is then the intent of the page. So what do you want them to do next? So once you've got them on that page, you've got an idea of, okay, well, they're looking just for information or they're looking for a transactional thing. They want to do this thing. Then are you helping them to reach that goal? So that that's something that then, you know, Google has also kind of talked about, like, and nobody's quite clear about how they measure it, but that kind of goal completion. So the goal completion could be, I just want your address or I want your postcode or the phone number of this company, those kind of informational things. Or the goal completion could be, I bought the socks that I wanted to buy. And so does your content match up to that kind of thing? And sometimes businesses are very good, again, with this kind of commercial thing where it's a bit like, oh, we want them to buy this thing. So we're going to write some content saying it's lovely and they should buy it. But it's not often that easy. Like sometimes the kind of informational queries, the stuff that comes higher up in the funnel, the thing you want them to do next is to read another piece of content or to sign up to your newsletter or to, you know, just to go away and think warm, fuzzy things about your brand because you know that that kind of purchase journey is a lot longer. Like a lot of the companies I deal with, they're not that kind of B2C direct immediate buy a pair of socks. You know, if they're a service company or, an, you know, nobody buys huge bits of medical industri industrial equipment on a whim. You don't just go and drop three million pounds on a, you know, huge microscopic machine that you're going to put into your lab that's not an impulse buy like a pair of socks it's much more of a considered journey there might be things that they need along the way to help persuade their ceo or their financial director and those kind of things so it might be that actually what you want from this piece of content is for them to download their you know persuade your cfo pack that could be the conversion so those are the kind of things that you know get what do you think that the customer wants what do you think google wants what do you want them to do and does your page help them with that kind of goal completion? Does it help them, you know, get to the thing they wanted to do, whether it's buying socks or persuading chief financial officers? So you've shared what SEOs should be doing in 2023. Now let's talk about what SEOs shouldn't be doing. So what's something that's seductive in terms of time, but ultimately counterproductive? Something that SEOs shouldn't be doing in 2023? Something that, so, which I think kind of touches on this topic a little bit is this kind of word soup idea, which I see from a lot of things. It can be very tempting. Um, there's some great tools out there that help you see things like the people also asked questions and then the related searches that you can get at the bottom. And there's lots of tools that will go out there and they'll grab all these possible questions and combinations around your kind of query, target query that you're going for. And the temptation can then be a bit like, right, well, I'm just going to write one absolute biblical piece of content that covers every possible additional question, 
you know, further question, the questions on the questions from those questions are the questions that the question they're going to answer next. And that can be really tempting to just be like, well, I'm just going to, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to aim this piece of content. So I'm just going to aim it at everything. It's the kind of throwing everything at the wall and hoping some of the stuff sticks. And there are times when that kind of works. So I've seen that, you know, particularly say with these kind of also asked.com is a great tool for these kind of things where it you know, pulls out the additional questions and that kind of initial research around a question, um, you know, particularly with financial stuff, like it'll be like, you know, what's the best mortgage for a first time buyer? And there'll be those related questions like, you know, how do I get a mortgage or, you know, which is the best bank or how much deposit do I need? Those are all kind of related things and that's good and that makes sense. You should put those in with your content too. But then you can kind of go down the rabbit hole quite a lot and you can go really deep and you end up with just yeah, these, these kind of word soup articles. Um, yeah, people kind of pointing AI writing machines at these kind of stuff, like they just pull out all the headings and like you just, you know, the AI writing machine just goes, goes wild. So I think it's really tempting and it can be really fun to say and occasionally it can be effective but it can be dangerous too i think like, you know you can it's often much better to think of seo just as one of your customers and uh, think of google so rather as one of your customers and to actually bear in mind your end customer as well like you know we've all seen those things where you get to an article and it's six thousand words long and you just think yikes i haven't got time for this i'll go somewhere else yes so absolutely. You know, Again, thinking about your customers, how you can kind of match those things up. You know, yes, it might be a good idea to get all those additional questions and related searches, but, you know, they may be two articles or three or ten. You don't necessarily have to just word soup it into one ginormous article. Stop feeding Google soup. Andrew Cox Darkey is the founder of Optimizey, and you can find him over at Optimizey.com. Andrew, thanks so much for being part of SEO in 2023. Thanks, David. Get your copy of SEO in 2023, the book, over at seoin2023.com.